All right, Trails Collective World, uh, this is Ian uh, coming at you with the uh, Western States Rundown uh, for a Trails Collective um, weekly live episode. Uh, for those that uh, may be tuning in with us live, thank you so much. For those who are tuning in after the fact, thank you as well. If you are tuning in live and you want to drop any comments or questions for uh, the guests into the chat room, go ahead and do that. Uh, do that via the Trails Collective's YouTube uh, channel or Facebook page. I still don't know why it uh, doesn't come through to my personal one, but uh, it just doesn't. Uh, so uh, head over on to the uh, Trails Collective uh, pages or channels and plug in comments or questions for our guests there. Uh, so, uh, yeah, we're going to hone in on Western States this one. Uh, next uh uh, tomorrow evening, uh, we'll have another TC Live, a couple this week. Uh, tomorrow evening, we'll focus on uh, what was a pretty great uh, weekend for the Whiteface Mountain Races, uh, which I hosted up in the Adirondacks. It was the U.S. Mountain Running Championships this past weekend. And then also uh, bring you uh, a couple voices from Allie McLaughlin and Max King from Mountain Marathon also this past weekend. Uh, so we'll uh, make it a mountain episode there, uh, as opposed to this track race that was uh, Western States uh, comparatively. And I know that's not the case, um, but we will hone in here. Uh, so I'm stoked to have the guests that we do uh, on, uh, Ellie Pell, who um, most people in the trail running world, I think, know at this point, whether they, they want to or not, they, they probably know who Ellie Pell uh, is. And uh, Marianne Hogan, uh, also um, probably on many of your uh, radars with a win at uh, Bandera. Uh, and the uh, one of third place, third place finisher at uh, Western. Is that, yeah, that's how it went down. It's all kind of a blur uh, at this point. Uh, so it is great to have you in. And you're coming in, and um, I know Ellie's got all these details uh, honed in. She's better at remembering such details. Uh, but where in Canada are you coming in from again? I'm from Quebec. I live in Montreal. Quebec, Montreal. Awesome. Mm -hmm. uh, Quebec, at least Quebec City has been on my bucket list forever, and I haven't gotten up there. Um, but I will just because it looks amazing. And I know that's not necessarily maybe where you're from in Quebec, but when I think of Quebec, I think I really got to get up to Quebec City. It's close enough. Um, and uh, uh, Dobbin, uh, some of you uh, may know, uh, has had some uh, solid 100-mile runs and wins uh, over the years uh, based in uh, New York, uh, Buffalo area, correct, Dobbin? Correct. Yep. Uh, is a pastor by day. Uh, so if anybody's looking for salvation on this episode and want to ignore Western states, just go ahead and plug your your questions regarding uh, how you may get saved uh, right in there. And maybe he can, uh, he can, yeah, I know, I know. I just thought I'd work that in. I know, we'll let it go. Um, and then uh, Arlen, it's good that uh, to have you with us as well, coming in from Ohio. I'm hoping that uh, the game uh, over your shoulder uh, doesn't eat you uh, during the episode. <laughs> Uh, it looks quite dead. Hopefully it stays that way. Um, but it is good to, to have you on. Um, and Ellie, um, I'm guessing you had a more formal and maybe professional uh, segue there. So if you want to add anything, feel free. You are wrong. I don't. But I have been, the, I have been instructed to ask to Arlen, do we consider Ohio the East Coast? I, I think Ohio is part of the East Coast and the Midwest. Like, I got to snag credit from everywhere I can get it. Us, us poor Easterners, we, or Midwesterners, it doesn't really matter. We're all under the radar, um, underrated. I think we all are kind of in the same boat here. That's where I'm coming from. And maybe that's even a, a good place to start. It's not necessarily starting from the beginning. Uh, but from us being uh, individuals coming from the uh, eastern portion of the um, uh, the continent here, at least, uh, not just the, the U.S., definitely underrated, right? I mean, even <clears throat> sitting, or I think Ellie uh, cued me to the handbook from uh, Western States there, the guide or something like that, and just totally shirked altogether, the, like the Bandera qualifiers, like you were there, but like not even giving you like any like love, like you, you don't even count anymore. I mean, they gave you the token tickets, but not enough to, to print you uh, in the in the catalog there, the uh, the book. 
And then uh, Arlen coming in from Ohio. Oh, yeah, maybe this guy's won a few hundreds or whatever, but he's from Ohio. Like this is this is Western States. You know, maybe he's in the mix, but uh, he's not really legit. He's from he's from Ohio. And it'll be the same thing uh, token by, uh, you know, Dobbin. Maybe the, the day shook out. Um, you finished uh, strong and well, but, uh, you know, I think written off coming from uh, New York, I would imagine uh, by by Mo. Same thing with the Deboba. I don't think Deboba came up in pretty much any of the um and anything related to the race even and i and sorry i'm tangential here it's the way my brain works but the even looking at the this um ultra sign up ranking for western states now take that with a grain of salt but debova i think had the highest ultra sign up ranking he was ranked like number one and it was funny because every time somebody was doing like a western states preview uh episode they'd show you the screenshot of ultra sign up then we going down the list and debova was like always on top and it's had some literally the, the first place and it's some solid finishes but not like one person that i caught would ever mention him it's like come on like at least a little acknowledgement there but maybe let's start there and, and as a point of discussion and weighing in on on the uh the, the east coast ish uh love there well i think for all of us actually maybe not marianne so much but um i mean even though like his ranking is like high um and arlen's too like until arlen won javelina like that like just the races that are on our ultra sign up aren't exactly like you know the big ticket sexy races so i mean we know how tough hellgate is and how like like how the like amazing performances that arlen's run in 100 miles like we know what that means but if nobody's been here or been to ohio they're not going to really know oh these are like legit races these people know how to run so what if and not to let's keep that discussion going and not to interject with a joke and derail the discussion but so what if we just gave right here in this episode uh here and now we just gave arlen as an example the new nickname the big ticket because then it's like, yo, like maybe he doesn't have some big ticket races, but his nickname is the big ticket, in which case that kind of gets around it. I mean, I'm a fan of nicknames. I think it's great. Like back in, you know, like baseball and basketball, all the all the good players had their had their nicknames. I think it's a good idea. I think he deserves it by now. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> Not flying under the radar anymore. <laughs> I mean, Arlen, too, is like a very hard man to track down. Like before Memorial Day training camp, I mean, Marianne knows I was like, you know, seeing where people were staying and looking at all that stuff. I try to find Arlen and just be like, hey, let's split an Airbnb. Like you're sort of East Coast. That was my thinking. And man is nowhere to be found at all. <laughs> and so I'm wondering, like after the race, Arlen, have you had to be a little bit more like online or are you just like nah too good for that like i'm just gonna go back home to ohio sorry yeah i i hung out out there for a while um a few days and and whatever but we just kind of like hid over by the coast uh, and stayed under the radar um but people can if if people really want to find me they can like it it ain't who you are it's who you know so i've had a lot of like my friends reach out to me and be like, so-and-so is looking for you. Can I give them your contact information? And I, I'm cool with that. So I think if someone really wants me, they, they can get a hold of me. <laughs> I don't know. I'm a pretty good stalker and I couldn't find you. <laughs> and it was like a little bit troubling to my ego. I was like, this sucks. And then, I mean, I met you, so it, it ended up being fine. But I mean, you're a pretty hard guy to track down. Do you have like sponsors knocking down your, you know, knocking down the door? Uh, not real. I mean, whatever. It's I, like, I take that as a compliment that you, that you couldn't find me, whatever. Mm -hmm. I'm cool with that. Like, I like flying under the radar. There's nothing more fun. That, like, I've been called a a everything but late for dinner. And I think my favorite title ever was at Havelina. They were saying that this is the unknown runner from Ohio. And I just <laughs> think that was the best title I've ever been given. So I'm cool with it. <laughs> Well, I was listening to uh, Corinne Malcolm say some, talk about you on a recent podcast, and she said that all your fans are called Arlen's Darlins, and I think that's precious. Yeah, so that came from Aravipa live stream. I'm not sure if it was Havelina or Desert Solstice. They've live streamed pretty much every event I've run, 
in the last like year. And it's, I don't know where that, we're still fishing to try to figure out who coined the term, but it's, you know, it's just something that someone after the race is like, do you know what everybody's saying? Like all your fans are calling themselves. And I'm like, I don't know. Cause I'm just out running. Like, I don't know what's going on in the chat, but I just roll with it. <laughs> You didn't I think I'm going to get like t-shirts for mom and dad that said Ar Ar Arlen's my darling. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be pretty cool. Oh, yeah. But go ahead, Dobbin. I think Arlen brings up a, a good point, And this may be one of those East Coast points. Flying under the radar in some ways gives you a little more runway to just kind of run and not be so wrapped up in what's going on around you is you can just focus on the run itself and fly a little bit under the radar. And I think that's an advantage versus how much focus there is, particularly on a lot of the West Coast runners or a lot of the runners that are in the Flagstaff, Arizona area is being from the East Coast means you can kind of fly under the radar. And so when you sneak in great wins and results, I, I think while it surprises some, for others who are knowledgeable about our area, it's, it's less surprising. Marianne, how about you? Kind of any other kind of thoughts there? Feeling the same way, or uh, times where uh, maybe it's been to an advantage, or other times where it's like, I don't know. Even if I'm not going to say it, it would be fun to have maybe a little bit of equal footing in uh, kind of coverage here. I don't know. I feel like whatever whatever uh, press or broadcast you have before the race like whatever happens you're gonna run your race regardless so I to me it doesn't really matter like I think it's a little bit of the same thing I don't think that I, I was uh predicted in the in a lot of the tops and and I'm really fine with that I like flying under the radar um when I, I went out and raced in South Africa uh for the longest time like when I when I was in second like running uh behind Courtney people were asking me what my name was beside the the <laughs> on the sidelines and they thought that I was South African for some reason so I just I just think that's funny and I and I think it, it takes the pressure off and it kind of makes it makes it fun you know you just do have to do your thing and 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 get to the finish line in, in whatever way you can get there so I'm fine with that as well and so Western occupying the, um, I guess how it's treated, uh, I don't, I guess, hmm, let's see how to say it. So for, I think a lot of runners, uh, ultra runners, uh, a hundred mile distance is this, um, someplace either they're doing, or maybe they'd like to get to, uh, it still represents the this pinnacle of like ultra achievement or whatever. And I know that's not the case for, for a lot of people, but at some point I think the mind goes there and then it goes to uh, for those that have been around it for a while to Western just being uh, the first and it gets a, maybe a lot of the media exposure. Um, and I think that there were several, uh, maybe rightfully so uh, tiring of the amount of, I guess, press that it was getting ahead of uh, this year and, um, but was this something that for all of you kind of was long on your radars? And it's like, yeah, I mean, like, I'd love to race uh, Western one day and kind of how am I going to get there? I think I may have the longest uh, wait in this. Um, so I was putting in lottery tickets for six years. So that's all of those different 100 mile runs to do it. So this was my 10th 100 miler. And it got to a point where I had kind of written off doing Western. If I didn't get in this year, I was just going to say, forget qualifiers. There's other things I want to do other than just qualifiers to get to Western States when I was pulled as number 211. So um, it certainly had been there as a motivator. And I think the, the longer that it went on, the more motivating it became to try to just get into the race. And there's a piece of me that wishes that it was seven years ago or six years ago because you know that's six seven years of of age and i'm a much older guy now than i was then so uh but nonetheless happy to finally be able to punch the ticket and go i mean i think like i mean i am like a little bit newer into the sport than um you davin and i don't know about marianne or arlen um but i did know like how hard it was to get into Western States. And so 
I think that, you know, when I started running ultras, I think it was like 2016 or 17. Like, I think that's everyone's like goal, like default goal, I think. Cause I also wasn't like competitive and, you know, so, I mean, I think back then I would have said like, yeah, I want to run Western States, but then after a couple of years and I realized like how, I mean, still an amazing race, but how hard it is to get in. I think I, um, just can like realize that like I may never run that race and that's okay because there's a lot of other races to do as well but that doesn't mean that I might not try to qualify or enter with tickets I've just sort just it was very apparent to me that like I might never run it and that's okay yeah I think we have a huge range here when I look at the screen Davin you know you spent six years trying to get in myself I got a golden ticket. I think the rest of us got a golden ticket. Um, you have to like, and I know for me, Western say everybody talked about it. And I always thought this will like never happen, or at least not while I'm in the peak of my career. Um, and it wasn't until Havelina came up and I had a chance at a hundred mile race because previously all the golden ticket races were hundred K or 50 mile. And for me, I'm a hundred miler. Like, I do horrible at anything shorter than a hundred miles. And so that gave me my little glimmer of hope there. Um, but even a year ago, that wasn't, that wasn't even like <clears throat> an option, but I, th I think it's neat that Western States is set up that everybody has a chance, but yet yeah, the elites still have, have their chance to to shine you know and to get there while they are still at their pe the peak of their career yeah um well i had it was kind of goal of mine this year because i had come back from like a lot of surgeries because i had broken my leg a couple years ago so i had registered to all three golden ticket races in the in, in the u.s and trying to make it happen and so i was kind of lucky that it happened on the first try but um it was definitely i, I can understand how so many, you know, it's it's kind of interesting to see how many people were registered on uh, at all of those three races, and it's kind of like in some ways, sometimes some of those golden ticket races can be even more competitive. And as Arlen says, like it's it's different, like it's a hundred k, so you have to be you have to be pretty speedy um, to win some of those. I hadn't registered for Tehavelina; um, it was the one that I hadn't registered for, but um, all three other ones I had registered for in the U.S. And remind me, what's your and. Uh, for the Connolly column, uh, question regarding Arlen, yeah, um, we'll plug that in just a second. So, um, Marianne, remind me, what's your history with a hundred mile distance? Uh, Western States is my first hundred mile. Okay. Um, yeah. So like getting there and even, I think it was, uh, Jeff Browning who made a comment to me, I don't know, maybe, I don't know, 15 years ago when he was, Kind of first starting into his uh um the trajectory toward uh, 100 mile distance as his focal area and with mountains i think is some of the effect of it you got to run 100 uh to know how to race 100 and so i mean for all of you uh it's kind of like the the big dance so to speak in terms of how much uh media and attention and maybe internal as well as external pressure is placed around a hundred. And for some of you who are in the focal uh, spotlight, like even more so, and, and you may be great, just kind of, you know, not really uh, placing too much uh, into that. And you can kind of kick back and just enjoy the event for what it is. But at some level, there's got to be some internalizing of that uh, media focus or whatever, and, and maybe not. Uh, but in terms of how you all ran, uh, I, th I think I was able to see, um, several of you at a couple points uh, throughout the day and like even just kicking off in terms of, I guess, uh, coming in with the experience uh, that you've had uh, Davin and Arlen and comparing that to like Ellie, uh, where Ellie and, and then Marianne, you've got the 100K feel under your belt, uh, but not quite knowing what that feels like when the 100 mile wheels come off later, which is a much different feel. And, and we've uh, related to Ellie, but when we saw Ellie in the initial feed and the, uh, the I run far uh, Twitter photo come up where she was uh, second over the escarpment, like right uh, behind Camille, it was like, well, that's cool. And that's a beautiful shot. But like, 
no, no, like, no, that is not the plan. Like, you're not supposed to be there. Um, I didn't have a plan. Well, we, we talked about a plan and kind of where I hope you to be. But until you get there, you don't necessarily know. Like, it may feel like an easy effort, but you don't know what that feels like later in a race. So did you all have some degree of a plan going in? Um, and how did that shake out? And how was it impacted by this being uh, your 10th 100 or your first? So if I'll jump in right now, um, in Ellie's defense, like I was just a couple steps ahead of Camille. Um, and like we were going super slow. So yeah, like, like regardless say- of what place she was in, we were going slow. Like we did not... Some of the guys that were out of sight at the top of the escarpment were running too fast, but the rest of us were just chilling right where we needed to be. Like, based on feel and how fast we were actually moving, um, I was shocked that Camille was even close to me. Like, I figured she'd be way up ahead, but we both, like, I felt like the whole elite field on the men's side went out super slow. So, for whatever it's worth. And like, to be fair, like, so I thought about this, like what I have done that differently. And I mean, there are a lot of things about my Western States race that I wish went differently or that now I know to do differently, hypothetically, if I ever put myself in that position again. Um, but I think the like the effort that I gave through, like until my stomach started to turn and like go off the wheels and then it was a little bit of a damage control. Like, I think the effort that I gave was actually appropriate. Like I was never pushing it. And I mean, I just was running the effort that I practiced in training that I knew I could sustain all day. So um, I think, yeah, I don't really know if I would change too much about it. I mean, except for maybe next time I'll just like talk with somebody instead of running up it like sort of alone. Um, but yeah, I don't, I mean, I like, to be fair, I didn't really think that I was like, I didn't really know what place I was in. Cause I was just like trying not to worry about what other people were doing. Um, and just trying to do what I felt like I could do. So obviously, I mean, it was my first hundred, so I'm not saying I did it correctly. I mean, maybe if I get another chance, I'll do it differently, but I mean, I don't think that I like burned any matches up the escarpment, if that makes any sense. And, and like to one note to add, a lot of, and Ellie, I think you hit the nail right on the head. A lot of people think that if somebody blows up and they finish in, you know, if they were going for 18 hours and they finish in, in 20 hours or 30 hours or whatever, like a lot of times people, the first thing they think is they went out too hard. But like, there's a lot of less. Ice. I think less than half the people that blow up in a hundred miles go out too fast. Like that's, that can be a problem. That will be a problem if you go out too fast. But I mean, Marianne Hogan did awesome. And she was, I looked back once and I saw her like 10, 12 miles into the race. Like she was going out with in front of Camille at one point. I mean, so like going out too hard is like only one of the elements to a hundred miles, obviously it's a pretty common one that people screw up on, but I mean, you got to go for it. You got to go with what feels right. Not based on who you're with. Yeah. I mean, I'm not, I made tons of mistakes. Like I definitely, I screwed up a lot, but I don't know if like my escarpment, like going, I don't think I went out too fast at that point. Like I know, I don't know, but I I guess I don't know. I mean, I'm the one that didn't, I'm the one that didn't get in the top 10. So in your defense too, like all of the girls that we were all pretty close, like behind, like we, like you might've gotten second, but it was like second. And then it was like three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. It doesn't doesn't really matter at that point if you're second or not. It's just. And one thing I noticed that happens a lot is people, you know, you hear so much hype all weekend about how you do not want to go up the escarpment too fast and a lot of people go hike up the escarpment and then bomb after that like they think they check that off that they went slow they were behind they were in 30th at the top of the escarpment and so now they can do whatever they want and that's only the first 30 minutes like that's you need a lot more strategy than that go ahead I was going to say, I was right there kind of in the back of the elite women, I think, coming up the escarpment. That's certainly not where I finished. Um, But as Marianne said, everybody was collectively kind of all together. There was a big pack and group together. I will say that it was interesting among the uh, elite women, um, 
they were all collectively very much talking with one another, whereas I felt like the guys were pretty quiet and just sizing each other up. And it's a very different, like, it was interesting kind of just as a perspective to, to look at the difference between the camaraderie that was there among the women versus the men. And that may be a reflection of kind of life as a whole, right? And kind of the, uh, the hundred mile being a microcosm <laughs> of, of life as a whole. Um, so in terms of, did you all have uh, certain strategies out there or was it just like, there's not a, you know, maybe there are certain metrics that I have in mind, but really I'm just kind of going to kind of just see how it, it shakes out and it shook out that way or anything that just kind of did go off the rails or anything that was uh, that stood out to you as some of the, the changes or modifications that you, you made? I'm sure others can speak to the races they had. And, and undoubtedly, any of us, we carrying whatever training we go in, we have ambitions and we have goals with sort of, depending on how you want to put it, ascending or declining goals based on how the day shakes out. Um, I've always been very good about never looking at the clock and never looking at my watch. And so in that way, whatever the race in the day brings, the day brings. And sometimes it's a fantastic day and sometimes it's a little different result than uh, perhaps I had envisioned to begin with. Um, Western States had its own challenges. It's really different from Burning River or Mohican or Oil Creek or any of the stuff that I've done out here in the East. I'd say our technicality in some ways is harder throughout the course of a race. By the time you got to mile 62, it felt like a track race. It was really predictable. Um, and that never goes away in the East. Like our stuff remains unpredictable and the footing remains hard throughout, throughout the race. Like our roots and rocks are just, are just different. Um, but the sustained climbs are, are not what we have out here in general. Um, so I would say I was surprised, even though I know it was net elevation down, the climbs were just a lot longer in duration than I really had appreciated prior to going. Yeah, Arlen, what was your strategy coming from, like, you've never run a slow 100 miler. So, um, and also I want to know, like, what your aid station strategy was. Like, I saw your crew and they were looking all professional and I was like, oh, I wonder what they do for Arlen when he goes into the aid station. Yeah, so just mute me if I if I go too long here. Um, a little bit of a deep dive. So yeah, I run 100 milers like all the time. So yeah, so my I strictly go off of effort based, and I felt like I ran very smart. Uh, was shocked to be hanging out with Adam and Hayden and a lot of those guys early in the race. They all ran out super slow, which made me nervous. When guys go out really fast. I feel like I, I find security in that. Um, but I mean, I can play just about any head game that can be played in a hundred miles too. So I wasn't overly concerned, but yeah, the aid station. So where there's crew access, I really had my game together. And I guess where I really screwed up was I had kind of calculated my calorie intake based on 320 calories, every crew access plus whatever I was getting in between at other aid stations, which ended up being almost zero calories because their sports drink they were serving was watered way down. And I didn't calculate that one section from Dusty Corners to, I believe it's uh, Dusty Corners to... Michigan Bluff. Michigan Bluff. Oh, yeah, right. Sorry. I, I would love to look at my splits, but it must have been like two hours there where I was just like way short on calories. And stupid me, I didn't put my finger on what was happening. Like, I don't know, like my training going into this was so solid. Like when I got to the race, I was thinking I worked way too hard for this. Like I, I trained way too specific. I put in way too much volume. I mean, I was healthy. I was happy. I couldn't, I wouldn't have changed it. But Honestly, like the, all the work I went that I put in kind of went down the drain when I made a stupid little calorie mistake. And actually my fitness was to my fate really, because I didn't really feel the bonk. I just noticed I couldn't climb anymore. And I was trying to figure out what was going on and thinking, what, a, this is terrible. I'm not even going to top 10 and like just, and it took me like so long to figure out that 
oh, it was just a calorie problem. And like once I got my calories back, I ran extremely well on the descents. Well, fortunately, Forest Hill on is almost all downhill, and that's what saved my tail. Um, I never did climb well after that. I struggled with cramping the rest of the time because of, you know, the mistake I made. But there again, like so many people are so obsessed with their fitness. And when I'm talking to someone that's going into their first 100 miler, I'm like, okay, just for a minute, just completely forget about fitness and simply look at race strategy. And like, even though I've done this, that, that was my 14th time to go 100 miles or beyond. I screwed it up again. But like my younger head, 10, 100 milers ago, my head would have gotten a spin. I wouldn't have been able to pull out of it. Like I wouldn't have made the best of the last 40 miles. So like I'm very happy with, and if I ran a perfect race and went 16 hours and placed thir third, I would be as happy as I could be. But I am not satisfied with the way I didn't get the most out of myself. And that's what I wanted to do. And I didn't do that. But it, all in all, like, even when it looked like I wasn't going to top 10, I was having just more fun than a barrel of monkeys. Like, I'm thinking, this is so much fun. I mean, coming from the East Coast and then seeing all that chorus in one day is totally worth it. Like, I can't think of any moment in the race where I didn't want to be there or I was mad or, like, it, everything was so much fun that it, like, so it outweighed any negative that was there. So that's kind of my, my race in a nutshell. I'm going to interject here, but then I want to go to Marianne and Davin too, and, and, and LA too, and have you guys talk about the same uh, things. Uh, but just because you were talking about your training and things going really well and it being your 14th, uh, there was the comment uh, made for uh, uh, viewers uh, during the I run far uh, pre-race interview. I thought I had heard Arlen say I eat 100 milers for breakfast. Is that the first time he's dropped that line in an interview and a reflection of your confidence? <laughs> you know what? That came to me just like bang right in that interview. I think that was the first time I've ever dropped that. So whatever. Um, yeah, it's. I guess it's my my lack of fear. Um, I've done so many of these, and now. At looking back on the way my head views these 100 milers, it's like Western states. I had a terrible day, had a hard time, but I loved every step of it. And that's the confidence that I took into it. And I still walk away with the same confidence that no matter what the day hands me, it's going to be a fun experience. And that's why I go into it with the confidence knowing, because a lot of people are so scared about what might happen out there. And it's they're scared. And I don't have that fear anymore because I've done too many of these and I know what the worst has to hand me and it's not that bad. Yeah, I feel the same way. Like there was no point where I was like, I don't want to be here at all. Even though like my stomach went south at mile 40 and it was interesting the, for the last like 60 miles. But um, there was no point where I was like, I don't, this is fun like anymore. And it's, yeah, I wasn't afraid of what was going to happen to me. Um, maybe I should have been because I like fell over the track. It was awful. But no, I mean, that's just kind of how I sort of go into races. It's just like, yeah, I'm just not afraid of what's going to go on. And it was a blast. Like I was, it was, I call it the longest, shortest day of my life. Like it was very long. I can't believe that I ran, ran for over 21 hours, but like it also, like I was very present the whole time. Like I was just in, in there and I didn't want to like speed up or slow, or slow down. It was just, um, yeah, I completely understand. And I actually have a question for, so this is your 14th, like, so that was my first. So like, what have you have, like, do they get better, you know, like after the first one? Oh, for sure. Like the amount of pain I go through is significantly less physical pain, but mostly just the way your head handles it. I always caution people after they run their first one to just chill and don't like think about another race. Don't plan anything afterwards because I know what my head went through, but I mean, yes, significantly better. Yeah, I'm going to agree with Arlen on this one. I, I think our body has an amazing, amazing physiological adaptation. And the more of these that you do, the easier it is that both your head and your body respond. The pain is always going to come, 
but you somehow are capable of overruling that in a sense of, yep, here it is. Yep, it's here. It's not going to go away. It's not going to get any worse. And it's not necessarily going to get any better. But, yep, I know this. I've been through this before. I can manage this. Um, and relative to my day, and I spent more time out there than, than the rest of you, there was never a question in the day that I was not going to finish. That was never entered my mind, even among the race that I had in the challenging moments. So um, similar to all of you, I just I was out there having a good time and I knew that no matter what, I was going to reach the end of the, the end of the goal in mind to, to get to the finish line. I think the opposite is also true, though. If you've never done it before, you don't really know what's waiting. So you don't really like you're just like, OK, let's do this. Like whatever happens, happens. <laughs> like, I don't know. I don't think you have to fear the unknown. But that's kind of just my perspective. I was just like, well, let's do this and see what happens. Let's see how long we can last for, you know. But maybe maybe that'll be the same approach for my second one. I don't really know. Sometimes that's how, I, how I approach looking at the trail <laughs> itself as being somewhat um not immersed in every little detail of the trail is that ignorance is bliss like hey look a mountaintop cool i didn't know we'd see this <laughs> marianne i think your mindset going into it is is very valuable looking back seeing how well you did and you went in with the right i think the right attitude and i think that produced good results ultimately i i kind of liked it that ellie and i we like shared it like just a few moments between like Robinson Flat and Dusty Corners, and we were both not doing well at all. <laughs> we were both like, oh, hey, Ellie, what's up? <laughs> and, I was like, oh. Yeah, 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 it is kind of funny. But then, again, it's so early in the race that it's really hard to predict, like, is my race really going that bad, or am I just feeling bad in this second, you know? So I think that's the most important thing to remember. That's my my biggest takeaway from 100 miles. Like, you can't focus on, like, the the... the the present moment as like a, a de facto of what's going to happen for the rest of the race. You just got to keep pushing through and eventually you're just going to feel better and you can just push, push even harder. So. And so for Arlen and Dobbin through your experience, you've both uh, gone through it uh, many times now. Um, but were there certain in Arlen, you commented on the on nutritional deficit and that is a big, that is a big chunk to, to be at a deficit uh, there. So. Uh, could be a, a calculated thing. It's tough. It's tough when you rely on something that is, and maybe this gets back to the aid station or your uh, crew rather, where Ellie uh, was wondering about if your crew was a well-oiled pit crew uh, in there and swapping things out. But for Western, when you're going hours or like aid stations between seeing your crew again, you are very much reliant on the aid stations being totally dialed in. So something that is as simple as, going too light on the hydration mixture can end up being a, a big deal there. Like if you don't know it and like can't taste the difference and you commented on that, but for Marianne Dobbin and, and Ellie, uh, any things that uh, kind of didn't go um, as they could have in a way that you mitigated or managed that or came back from that? Well, go I ahead, Marianne. Yeah, I can see it really quickly. I, I felt very, very sick. So right after I saw Ellie, I started feeling very, very sick. And then right after last chance, I, I threw up and I had never, ever thrown up in the race before. And I basically throw, threw up everything that was in my stomach. Like that was very, very surprising. Like it almost caught me by surprise. Like what's going on with my body? Um, and it's not as if like it was past a certain distance that I hadn't ran before. It was just very strange. And quickly, like it, in my mind, I was like, okay, like clearly everything that I've eaten up, up until this point could be an issue. So I'm not going to do, do anything that I've, that I've eaten, but it was also everything that I had planned. So from that point on, it was like I had to build a new nutrition plan in my mind. And that's just what I did. Like I switched everything. I didn't eat a single thing that I had eaten like before that. And, and I had just to adapt and, 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 and try something else. So. I think that to me was the biggest surprise that, you know, you can you can build a nutrition plan, you can build a race strategy, but on race day, something will happen that's going to send everything haywire. And you, the important thing is just for you not to panic and just react to the situation and move on, you know. And so what did you what was one of the things that maybe you turned to in that portion of the race? And you're like, I, you know, I've never looked at the aid station table here before. And suddenly that looks really good. and I'm going to eat it. 
Yeah, well, the first thing I did is slow down quite a bit because I, from that moment where I threw up, I had to go down all the way down the first hand and then back up. So I really, really slowed down in that portion. And I think it almost helped me because then I was way stronger in the end of the race. Um, but when I got to the aid station, I, because I was worried about anything, I was just eating like um, anything natural. So like watermelon, potatoes. Um, and then I, I relied on heavily on Coke. Uh, I <laughs> like every A station. I think you see me chugging down the Coke. <laughs> uh, so it was, and then whenever I would get to an A station, I would just ask for potatoes and salt and then watermelon. So and it, it got me through the finish line. There was a, a, a great quote, and I can't remember exactly how the story went, but a friend, uh, Louis Escobar, uh, interviewed. Um, uh in the moment uh that we're live i'm spacing on his name the prior uh olympian uh with a, a lakota background um sue uh one of the greatest i think 5k 5k 10k uh, runners of all time in terms of the u.s Come on, help me out here. It's probably like, uh, I don't know what. No, God, gosh, you're all too much trail ultra people to. Uh, Sorry. We got nothing. Of, uh, uh, Billy Mills. Billy Mills. I was going to say Billy Mix, but then I was like, nah, Ellie, you wrong. <laughs> oh, gosh. All you are. So, uh, yeah, Billy Mills. I, I think it was ahead of the. I, I can't remember whether he doubled up in an Olympics, maybe with a 5K, 10K or something like that. And he was just feeling like torched. And I think maybe going into the 10K final, I think before he, I think, took the win, uh, somebody introduced to him, I think it was like a Snickers bar or something like that. Maybe it was like, I don't know how far back Snickers goes, but it must have been like pretty early. And it's not, not something that he had ever experienced as he ate this Snickers bar. And he just suddenly felt like totally like energized. And he was like, whoa, like this is like, I'm good to go. And I think whatever he won, like the Olympic gold. And he made this funny quote in the uh, the Road Dog podcast with Lewis about attributing his uh, his 10k gold medal to uh, to the Snickers bar, which was awesome. So Dobbin, yeah, what about you, what's your Snickers bar out there, or how'd it go? <laughs> um, well, I had some pretty significant calf cramping pretty early on. By mile 20, mile 30, I was already um, having calf cramping going on, particularly on downhills. And so going into the first canyon, that posed a real problem. That should have been a place, generally been a pretty good downhill runner that I caught up on some time. And instead, I was taking time and um, trying to stretch out my calves. And by the time I got into Devil's Thumb, when I came in, they said, what can we do for you? How are you doing? And I said, you know, I've got some really bad calf cramping. And they threw me up on a massage table, at which point both of my legs froze tight. And I was screaming in agony. And they dug in there with their thumbs and loosened everything up and I didn't cramp the rest of the race uh and ran the downhills well out of there and so I guess I could say in some ways that saved the race I was going to go on no matter what but it it was um it was not something that I expected to experience that early on I thought my training was pretty spot on I had done a lot of stuff to make sure that I had hills and, and the strength uh in my legs um so that wouldn't happen in whether it was the high country and just how I was dancing through the high country or whatever it was, that for me was, was the challenge that I had to get over. And once I had that little bit of the massage on the table, it, it cleared up and, and uh, the race unfolded pretty well from there. So that was a, a transformative event then. So maybe on the, um, on your, uh, your your parish or your church there, you need to have a little back room uh, massage parlor going on in the back, which is just like, you know, Dobbin's secret sauce kind of massage room that we don't talk about in the back. But you know. it, it, what was interesting for me is they had two guys working. One clearly was the the lead guy, and he was working with somebody who I felt was almost like a resident, somebody just coming into this. And he was like, yeah, you can see there how the gas rock is glued right to the bone and how it's just seizing up right now. And I'm just laying on the table screaming like, yeah. Um, so, but you know, they worked it out. It was, it was, it was a good time. And Ellie, I saw some of your, uh, your wheels, uh, come off, but to your point earlier, you mentally, you were, um, 
you weren't always happy with me, but you were always in the game and never wanting to pull the plug. And so things that um, you were uh, checking and, and uh, mitigating. Yeah. Um, so I think that like, kind of like what Arlen dealt with a little bit, the, um, at, I was, uh, I had like pre-mixed bottles for my crew, but then I was just going to refill, which I did refill with sports drink at every aid, but it was just not, it was watery. Like, but I wasn't really thinking about that. Like I was doing really well with nutrition. I was on my schedule, but, um, and then also talking with Jeff Browning afterwards, like I definitely wasn't getting like 700 milligrams of sodium an hour. And I think that, really ended up like messing up with my gut. So like, and also then like Marianne, like uh, after mile 30, like I couldn't eat any of the, any gels, anything like that. Um, and so I started switching to like turkey and cheese sandwiches <laughs> and like pe uh, uh, peanut butter and jelly, which before this race, I have a rule that I don't eat peanut butter in races because like I eat it so much outside of races that if it ever made me sick during a race, like that would be very sad. But that's like the only thing that I could think about going down. And then, but it was just, it, it, it was actually like painful for me to eat. And so then after eating, I would need like a mile or two to like not feel absolutely nauseous again. And so then like when I wasn't at aid stations or wasn't seeing crew, um, I wasn't really eating. And then when I would get to the aid station, I would try to eat a lot. But then I thought I was eating a lot. But then Ian pointed out afterwards, like, you, yeah, you had the sandwich. We were like a couple bites of it. And then so it was really important for me when I got my pacers, actually, like they were really good about like, encouraging me to still keep trying to eat even if it like hurt and stuff so that was good but that was mile 60 by that point so I think I was a little, in a little bit of a deficit not just sodium and hydration wise but also calories and then I also noticed due to lack of hydration I was peeing like a lot a lot a lot and so I think that I just wasn't absorbing water so my body just had like a little bit of its own like internal freak out dance party and I just don't know what was going on so but at least I know like already I have like notes on my iPhone of like how I could do it better next time um so that's good because I think if I had got in 14th place with a 2130 and felt that I had had like an amazing out of the park race then I mean there wouldn't I I don't know I guess like I see room to grow and I see room to get better and that's kind of what I'd like to do And so a, a question in here from uh, Caleb, another uh, really uh, speedy runner um, out of West Virginia and has also run some really fast, uh, great 100 milers. Uh, he's also a coach. Uh, what was the most special moment for everyone? Was it seeing your crew at a specific aid station, finishing on the track or some other part during the day? Um, Since I mean, I live. The, fun, the funnest part for me was I, I was like, uh, I was running with my best friend, Amelia, and we came into this aid station and we're at the, we're looking at the food and stuff. And then she looks up to the guy trying to refill my water and she goes, oh, you're Rob Crar. And it was Hal Carter, who was <laughs> like very different looking than Rob Carr. But I just looked at her and I was like, no, that's Hal Carter. And like, first of all, I couldn't eat, but I knew who this celebrity was. And then I look up and Scott Jerk is right there. And I was like, do you know who that is? And it was just really funny at that moment because I was miserable. Like, I, I am so glad she still likes me. Like, it was just, but that was just moment just like picked me up a little bit. So I have to say that's probably like, was probably just like one of the, one of the highlights when I really needed like just to laugh a little bit. <laughs> You did. And you had time to process because at that point, I think you were moving at about 83 minutes per mile. So you <laughs> had some time to, to process it. Yeah. That's assuming something that Amelia has to tell you not to stop walking. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Yeah. I had I had a little bit of the same problem when I got to the aid station and saw Scott Jurek. He's like, what what can I get for you? And I'm like, uh, are you Scott? And he's like, yeah. And I'm like, uh, how about a fist bump? Like, <laughs> come on. Um, but anyhow, uh, 
that aside, probably the, the oh, and a big shout out to to Caleb Bowen in the chat. I'm assuming that's Bowen in the chat. Um, awesome guy. He's got to get out the states anyway. Um, but while well, he's tearing it up on the East Coast, good good for him. Uh, my my favorite moment of the race had to be when I got on the track and found out I was going to have to sprint to keep ahead of Tyler. Like that was looking back, I didn't see that coming at all. Like I thought I put a good gap between him and like just the fact that I outran someone who was closing on me was, was special because I think like you're automatically had if you get caught from behind um, just the predator and prey aspect of a race. Um, I just think that like, that's such a big element and like, and also the fact that he caught me at 85 miles in the aid station. He caught me at Pointed Rocks, 94 miles. And then he caught me again on the track. And like, just the fact that I was able to outrun someone that was on my heels for two and a half hours was the highlight of the race. And people were asking me like, what's so great about third place? You know, it's, it's just a podium, whatever. But my response is more like, is that, the story i want to tell my grandkids someday is that tyler green caught me on the track and, and outran me on the track like is that the way i want to tell the story and i guess that kind of answers it uh, How about for you marianne yeah, uh, special right. moment or highlight on the in the experience yeah i mean i had two moments i really really enjoyed the start line like i think the start line was just like a very emotional moment for everyone and it was kind of nice because like we we had the chance to go out for western states memorial camp or just a lot of different people that you know on the start line and everyone is just so happy to be there because everyone knows the work that everyone has put forward to be there so i think that was a very nice moment um i really enjoyed that and then um throughout the race like for me it was so exciting to see my crew um, because oftentimes, like, I would feel so sick and I felt like I was having the worst race of my life. And then I would show up to my crew and they'd be like, you're doing so good. <laughs> they were like, at one point, like, they, they told me, like, I was getting closer to the podium and I really, really didn't believe them. And it was just really, it was just funny interactions, you know? Like, I was just, my goal was at one point, it was only to finish the race. And when I got to the next station, they, they said, like, oh, if you keep going this race, you're going to make it on the podium. And it's just nice to see like they bring so much enthusiasm to your race and even if you're not doing so well like you might be doing well and it's it's kind of nice to just share the enthusiasm with different people that are also following along and and i thought that was that was really fun and and, and special to share with my family and my friends that's funny when fun Aiden to told me that he was like you're you could compete if you run in the next 20 miles and i just like was like not having it i think it's like the worst look of my life <laughs> so bad i was like i'm about to throw up <laughs> yeah you, you weren't yeah you <laughs> you weren't pleased with me saying that but i had to at least plant the seed that you were yeah. still in contention of top 10 if somehow things turned around and, and they didn't necessarily turn around me, like, um, but over and died <laughs> but even if they did i think you you would have finished probably 11th so you know i didn't know how to you know try to motivate you but also be like well you'd only be running for 11th like i don't want to tell you there because leah Leah wasn't coming back, um, but it was fun to see you at the uh, Marianne also at the start with Ellie and um, felt like I was kind of standing there just taking it all in, uh, connecting with some friends. And uh, but just as you guys were about to line up, I think you came over and said, Ellie, let's go. And then you very patiently waited for Ellie. I think she had to do something for like a minute or two. Maybe I think to take off some clothes, I think yeah. take off her pants and some other stuff. And I know you're probably like, let's go. But you and then you kind of you both ran off together. And it was fun to see just that uh, kind of the, the friendship or, or going off into this maelstrom of, of people into this grand adventure ahead. But like, I don't know, like two kids, so to speak, that were just stoked to be on the day and yeah. setting off together. I thought that was a pretty precious moment, if I can use the term uh, precious uh, there. It was fun to watch. Uh, and then, uh, Dobbin, how about for you in terms of a uh, special moment uh, uh, throughout the day or the experience or moments? Well, I probably had two. My dad has been sort of my chief crew person. And as a physician, he has approached 100 milers and ultras almost like an experiment, a, a personal experiment of one. So he has maintained these logs and notebooks of hydration and nutrition through all of the 
ultra that I've done. And so I think for him, as much as it has been for me, this was a sense of something that we were working towards or looking to get to. Um, and so to have him, he was at the track. I wanted him at the finish line and he was like in the infield doing, I don't know what. So it was a little disappointing that he wasn't right there at the finish line, but to have him there in the stadium was, was a big deal. And my first pacer also talked about how influential I was in getting them into running. And I think having them share that with me as they were about to leave their pacing duties after uh, Rocky Chucky. So, um, coming up out of the river and going into that next aid stage. And they shared like, you, you don't realize how influential you've been in my life and how much your running has influenced me and who you are. And, and I just was like, okay. Um, you know, at that point, I think we're all just trying to get to the finish and we're starting to smell the hay in the barn and, and want to put it there. But those were the two meaningful moments for me, for sure. And that is pretty sweet and also sweet that your dad can use you as the, you know, the experimental station over the, uh, you know, just getting to, to Western, but that is pretty funny that it was in the infield, but, uh, not there at like the finish proper. And you know, what were you doing there, dude? Come on. Well, and to be fair, my dad is older now. So I kind of said to him, okay, you know, this is it. This is it for you. It's time for you to retire from being my crew chief. You're getting old enough that, that this, this has been a good run for us. Um, but I'm for you to hang it up. Um, so you're, you're putting them out to pasture as a crew tree crew chief, huh? That's the, uh, well, we'll see. I, I can't control him. So yeah. 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 Um, and, uh, Arlen, in case you didn't see it in the chat, uh, Caleb said, I just screamed at, well, I'll just put it up here. Um, I just screamed at the fact that Arlen knew who I was, <laughs> which is, <laughs> Yeah. Um, hey. Yeah. So uh, the big show uh, does, or the big ticket, the big ticket does know who you are, uh, Caleb. And um, it'd be fun to see you two uh, throw down at a uh, a race uh, coming up or in the near future. Um, I think it's a little tricky for Caleb when he's uh, coaching so much and uh, constantly in season. But we got to get you guys to go in head to head on uh, one of these. Um, yeah, Ellie, if for. Go ahead, Arlen. Sorry. Oh, I was just going to follow up with Caleb. I definitely know who the guy is, but I, I want to see the guy get up here to Mohican, um, so and run the Mohican 100. So when he's when he's coming up to run it, uh, shoot me up. I uh, I want to pace you because I never get tired of pacing people to the win. So pace you. I want to see you two throw down. I'm not talking about you know you know pacing duties here. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I'd love to throw down with the guy, but to try to get us both in the same race, um, I guess I might have to drag him out to Havelina this fall and go for a golden ticket. So that's there's the other one. Let's go for it. There it is. Um, so, Ellie, did you have, like, maybe things in your head in terms of any other, like, questions or, like, any rapid-fire things thrown out? And it's okay if you didn't, but just to open that up. Well, I mean, I guess like selfishly, I mean, it was my first like hundred miler. So like what, and I mean, Marianne's too, I guess. So there are things that we could probably like do better. So I guess both Davin and Arlen, what are some things that like maybe we, maybe we've said that have like, oh yeah, I dealt with that too in my first one or something. And like, I don't know. I mean, I'm like, I go through swings about how I felt my performance was and, um, and so, but I know that I can do a lot of things better. So like, are there any things that you remember in your first hundred that like, oh, I wish I did this afterwards, or I wish I had, uh, or for the next one, I fixed this and it really made a difference. Um, it's complicated. And particularly if you've had a very good first hundred experience. So my first hundred I won. And so that became hard to base change off of when you come out of a win, because you sort of say like, well, what did I do right? How do I replicate that? My Western States in some way, it is my slowest and my poorest result of every hundred I've ever done. Um, and yet I don't have a reflection that it was a failure by any stretch of the imagination. 
And part of what I think that I executed well at Western States that I've learned over time is you have to run aid station to aid station. You cannot look at the race as a trajectory of the whole thing. You have to look at it in small bites and pieces. And when you do that, it never feels overwhelming. It constantly feels like something you're capable of achieving that next small goal in. Um, and, I, and that's out there in the literature. Many people have said it. This is not new. But it really does resonate that if you can just put your mental energy into reaching that next place or that next crew access, it makes a big difference in sort of your morale versus thinking about, oh, my gosh, I have 40 miles yet to go. I've already gone 60. I can't imagine 40. But if you're only thinking, well, I only have 5.4 to the next day station, that's all I'm focused on. I think it's much easier to digest those small pieces. Yeah, I couldn't agree with Dobbin more. I mean, like, yeah, it's way too much to grasp in one. I think I kind of can now because I've run so many of these. But, yeah, it's very crucial for first-timers to never look at the overall picture, but just simply to look at the next candy bar that's waiting at the next aid station. By the way, I love the shout-out to Coca-Cola, Marianne. At least half of my belt buckles that I have instead of a DNF are due to some late race Coca-Cola. Coca-Cola. Um, so that's, yeah, that's a big one for me. Um, but yeah, I mean, both Ellie and Marianne, like, you guys ran incredible races. I mean, Marianne's, that that was insane. Just like Adam Peterman, to go out there a first-time 100-miler and nail it on a Western State scores. I mean, that's, that's just insane. Um, Ellie, I mean, I, I think you ran a smart race. I think, like, in your defense, you have a good, like, you have some good excuses. But the danger of excuses is saying when you're in the race and you're throwing up or having a rough day, the danger there is to just be like, well, at least I can tell a good story when I'm done and not, like, leaving it all out there and not, like, turning it around and fighting hard. I mean, Marianne, that was incredible, you throwing everything up. To date, I have not thrown up during a race. So, like, you may have some territory there that I cannot help you through. And that's the, <laughs> that's the sick part about my mistake at Western States, a calorie deficit. But I can't blame it on the fact that my stomach turned. Like, I could have easily consumed anything I needed to get me to the finish line. But there again, that was just a mistake. But I think, like, I remember going into uh desert solstice my first 24-hour race which i only made it 18 hours and i remember my head being just trashed when i went into it because of all these mental notes you think of so many different things people say things you listen to podcasts and you hear all these little nuggets of truth and you keep thinking don't forget this don't forget that i don't want to be the first one to the top of the escarpment i don't want this i don't want that and pretty soon, like, you're carrying around a wrecked head. And you're going into a race that's 90% mental with a, with a head that is 90% spent. And, like, many times I think, like, success comes from simply going into it relaxed and not worried. And just, like, I think it's good to get your plan in place, but then just enjoy the day and just let your head rest the day or two before the race um, because like I think so many times people worry about all these different things and it may be all true and valid to what they need to do that day but you got to take care of the most important muscle in your body and that's your brain like because that's the one you need the most to get you through those tough times and just personally, because I'm like a nerd, um, Arlen, you really only do 100 milers. So like during your weekly training, do you do workouts? Yeah, so I do very, very little amounts of workouts just with my volume. It's it doesn't really permit for a lot of of like high intensity workouts. Um, but like some of my runs could be almost in the category of a workout like my hill repeats as easy as i may be going on the climbs it still looks like it still probably looks like a an interval some interval training um but i focus mainly on just seeing how comfortable how many hours i can spend in a week 
running at 100 mile effort. And I think that really helps with nutrition. Uh, a lot of things that coaches don't talk about. A lot of them say, you know, you need to try what you're going to do on race day during your training. And then they'll say things like, just don't run more than 20 miles because your mu muscle cartilage is tearing down, you know, and you're, you're doing yourself, you know, a disservice. And like, that's where I start to disagree with a lot of the coaches because sure, whatever it does to your muscles, like it obviously has not wrecked my muscles running back-to-back -back marathons almost every weekend out of the year. But also like, I think the value in those back-to-back -back long runs is like putting your body in a strain where it needs the nutrition. Because if you go out on a 10 mile run and start fueling, like sure, your stomach might handle that fine, but your body actually isn't craving that yet. It's not relying on that yet. And so like, I think that the valuable training is more getting used to race day scenario. You know, if you go and, and with all respect, like you've got to take care of yourself. You can't get injured. Like if you're risking an injury, that's stupid to try to get ready for a hundred miler and like, be riding the fence of injury the whole time but there's a lot of value i think in like doing long runs that way you're getting more familiar with pulling on the nutrition that's you're going to need on race day and for you uh Arlen, just because you mentioned it in terms of the volume, what's the volume that works for you? And you, when you're coming off a really good uh, training cycle going in, uh, what did that look like to give you the, the confidence, basically kind of all in? This is what not that it's going to work for, I don't know, 80 percent of the other people out there that might be listening. But what worked for you? Yeah, so I typically like to get 125 miles a week or something like that for for my peak volume. Um, I got injured extremely bad during jackpot back in February, went into the race with a little nick in my hip and just got eaten up during the race. Um, could hardly walk the next couple of days. Didn't run for four weeks. Longest break I've had in two in, in over two years. Um, so like with that, you know, setting the stage for my training build up for Western States till I got into like the second phase of my build up. I was feeling so rested and so well. I, I think I was like over 150 miles a week with like 20 to 25,000 feet of vert. Um, not that I needed that. Like I could have done just as well with a lot less than that. But I felt like my body was saying, just go for it. Like you're rested, you're ready for this and just go for it. But that's where I'm at. Like, don't think you have to do what I do to get the results I get. Like, a lot of people can do with far less volume. It's like I said earlier, it's much more important that you have good plan, good strategy. Race day strategy is like 80% of it. Fitness is like 20. So there you have it. And how about for uh, Dobbin, uh, Marianne, what did, uh, what did it look like for you to feel like um, you went in uh, all in, if it went that well, uh, what did it look like for you? Just that 40,000 foot view. I, I thought I was definitely in the hunt for a sub 18, um, which is not what I ran, not even close to it. Um, I maxed out or my peak week was about 125, just like Arlen. And I had four runs in there. that were all over four hours plus one was six hours plus. So a lot of time on feet. The, the big challenge i think for me particularly in the buffalo area is it is flat as a pancake here so getting in vert is a really big push i gotta travel in order to find vert which i do but even still it's not getting in the amount that i would like um and maybe that could could be you know a contributing factor to some of the issues that i ended up having um but i was very comfortable with my training and pretty confident going in and in some ways that that even held me through my low points to know that I knew that the training somewhat was in the bag and I was in a, a good place in that way um, but I'm 45 years old so my body has a lot more miles on the odometer and so I have to be sort of careful and I now talk about my body like I do a car like the engine runs well but the chassis is feeling a little off or the chassis is feeling okay but the engine's got a knock in it um but I was still able to achieve some of the mileage that I did, you know, a decade ago when I was younger and the body could just take it a lot better. 
I peaked at like 85 miles. So, uh, I don't know. My old body is just not like what it used to be. So, uh, <laughs> 85. Um, I run around 100 miles a week. Um, that's kind of what I like. But I got pretty seriously injured too. Um, in in March, I dislocated the bone in my in my foot. Um, so I I had to pull back. Um, but mostly I like to run 100 miles. And then just a couple of weeks, maybe like three weeks before, I did a bigger week. I did like 130 miles. Um, and I don't think that it was necessary, but I, I think it 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 helps me feel better with the long distance. And to be honest, I just appreciate running. Um, I'm not someone who will do necessarily workouts. I just like to go out and run and spend some time outside. So it's easy for me to kind of just accumulate the mileage. Do you guys do these in singles or doubles? Been... Definitely doubles for me. I work, so nine to five. So <laughs> I do a lot of doubles. Yeah, so in the past, I have done almost all singles. I would get 100 to 140 miles a week in six runs. Um, but building up to Western states, my vol overall volume was higher, and I did a lot of doubles um, just kind of as an experiment. Um, looking back, I don't think it really hardly matters how you slice and dice 150 miles in a week. Like the overall volume is high enough that I – I don't think it makes a big difference how you do it. I think it's more just that amount of time on feet is going to produce fitness. But like one, one thing, like, like I said earlier, fitness is, is a very small portion of, of whether or not you're going to do well, but it is a big count confidence booster too. Like Marianne said, like when you're struggling with your low point, I never, when I was, couldn't run the climbs, I never said to myself, well, my training block was just off and that's why I'm having trouble. Like it's a, it's an excuse eliminator. And to me, that's big. If you have no excuses going into a race, your head is going to be in a good, a good position to fight. Just an interesting thing that I noted, both Arlen and Marianne having injury early in this year, the best hundred I ever ran, I had injury in February of the year that I ran that in late May. And I don't know if that forced time off basically changes things in a way, makes you hungry in a different way. Um, I'm not sure, but it's interesting to see that three of us have sort of had a very similar experience following on injury in the same year that then we competed and had very promising results coming out of competition. When the injury happened to me, I kept, and I was going through it, you know, slightly a rough time. I just kept repeating to myself that this was good, you know, <laughs> this is needed rest and it was going to help me in the long run. So I kind of agree with what you're saying, but I don't, I, I guess we'll never know unless uh, next year I'm not injured and I go back and see what happens, but there's also a lot of other factors going on. So I guess we will never know. Yeah, Davin, that's very interesting. You, you brought that up because I was feeling that going into the race. I was feeling better rested, even though I the volume was uncomparably bigger going into Western States. I still felt better rested and better, more ready. And I honestly, that would have been the performance of my career had I not screwed it up on race day. Um, because last year, like my best two performances of my career were Mohican and Burning River, five weeks apart. And Burning River was arguably better than Mohican. Um, and why did I do so well back to back when I, at a time of the year, I had already run a hundred miles in, uh, beginning of April. I come back in June, my best performance in my career, five weeks later, an even better performance. And why did I do that? Because I had good race day strategy. Like I executed a plan. Well, well, how did I do with Western States? Not that great. It was good objectively but it wasn't good compared to what I could have done if I had executed a good plan on race day. So there's a lot of truth to like injury producing good results, but you still have to race day execution. So Ian, four months out for my goal race, I need you to hit me in the knee with a club. <laughs> <laughs> and that's, and I wonder if there's some degree of, just a physiological component there where we as a species at that time of year, particularly here in the Northeast, there's not as much sun, uh, it's colder, days are shorter. Like we should be kind of, I don't know, 
resting more, bundling up, hacking on uh, more food, uh, maybe eating or whatever. I don't know. Or maybe maybe that's the reverse. Maybe evolutionary wise, we should be getting pretty uh, deficient in calories there. But I don't know. Maybe there's something where that's just a natural cycle uh, that when you're going too hard through the winter, it just ends up being too long of a year. And your body is just I don't know. It's just it's a long ways to go. Uh, even seasons wise uh, coaching you know, when I'm uh, coaching, uh, even as a prior competitive runner with cross and, and outdoor, I would never really take indoor that seriously um, just because that's a long time to go to try to, to kind of fire for so long. Um, so uh, maybe that is a pretty bankable coaching strategy to have your uh, athlete uh, injured or just be like, even if you're not injured, I'm sorry, you're going to take a month off in February and that's just how it's going to be. All right. Um, anything else that would be fun to talk about? Anything else uh, for the chat? Uh, Travis, Travis, if you're still on, thanks for that comment uh, earlier saying, does all of this inspire Ian to line up for another 100 miler? I don't know. I think I'm much too weak between the ears for, for 100 milers. Um, and I don't know. And I feel like I'm. it's tough for me where putting on the events for so many years really takes a lot of that emotion and energy. So in this, I'm just coming off an eight week or a 10 week period where I think I put on seven races in in nine weeks. And one of the weekends off was going out to see uh, or try to support Ellie uh, at Western. So I'm just cooked. And I think I ran maybe like eight times in eight weeks or whatever. And so that just doesn't bode well for trying to do any of your own races. But there are some out there. They're always on the bucket list. There's I've wanted to do, um, um, I don't know, a number of them. Uh, which, you know, it may never happen. One that's on the radar is High Lonesome. So uh, I would love to try to find a way into that uh, lottery, just a, a beautiful uh, race. And so there's a bunch of those out there, but I don't know whether they ever come. But this crew is inspiring uh, to your point. Uh, so it makes you kind of want to get out there and do it. So uh, thank you to all for being inspiring and taking your time. Um, and then any other as we're getting into the call for uh, questions or final comments here, uh, let's see, Clement, um, Clement, and, and congratulations on your uh, U.S. citizenship. If I was uh, catching the post right this past uh, uh, weekend, congrats, man. It was interesting following the stories. Runners caught COVID a few weeks before Western two, and what rest did uh, for them? And it seemed like that was a mixed bag. And it's tough to know on COVID, and especially how the research is uh, playing out, where. There's some pretty solid research that's not that's saying there's nothing there's nothing physiologically to long haul symptoms that uh, actually the highest risk is a precursor if somebody has um, is a high anxiety individual. And so I think it's pointing towards the reality of the placebo playing into the physiology. But I think there's still so much unknown. So with COVID, I heard mixed things out there. Like some people had it and seem it had no impact. Others were like, maybe I had it. And who knows? But um, it was interesting hearing that as well. Um, Caleb, with another comment, uh, does higher volume in the buildup help with recovery? And I can let you guys weigh in on that. I guess I um, know as well. Well, I'll let you guys weigh in on that. Yeah, uh, absolutely. I think higher volume, as long as you don't get there injured. But if you if you feel good in your taper, the higher volume you did in your buildup, I think the better you're going to recover. Um, I know from Western states, it was... It was so sad. I almost cried the next morning when I found myself carrying two suitcases down the stairs. And after a good race, I should be hanging on to both handrails going down the stairs. Um, but not only was that high, uh, contributed by high volume, it was also contributed by poor race day strategy. So there you have it. I would say so. I mean, my recovery has been pretty well. I'm pretty much back to what I would call average training at this point. Um, and we're not that far out from, from the race. I was shuffling around more than Arlen, so I suppose that says that I left it out there a little more. I soaked in the American River the day after, so perhaps there are some, some effects of just sitting in the river all day. That was a, a benefit in the recovery. But I think the high volume, yeah, the body is just, it's so used to taking that that I think that it recovers well from, from it. 
it's hard to tell. Maybe next race I can lower my volume and I can get back with the with the more accurate answer. <laughs> but for now, I think that uh, yeah, I'm recovering fairly well too. I think the next day is hard for me to go uh, go up and down the stairs though. Um, but actually, two days removed, I was actually already much better. So um, I, I wouldn't say that I'm back to regular schedule, but I'm getting closer to it for sure. And then Ellie, you're about to. Uh start up with some shuffling as well, right? I mean, you've, um, it seemed like I for mean, you, it's just as, just as much mental as physical in terms of needing that that break and getting back to it. Yeah, I really needed a break. So uh, I'm not really rushing into anything. I mean, I love running, so I miss it. So, um, but I don't have any races on this schedule. So I'm really just making sure to take the mental time that I need because uh, recovery was a little bit uh, rough for me. So uh, yeah, I am just uh, taking the time that I need, but hopefully be shuffling around soon. I hope so. I just miss running with my friends and doing that kind of thing. And so uh, that's mostly, you know, what's, what's going to miss, but my uh, shin swelled up pretty nicely uh, after the race. So I'm really just making sure that that is completely healed before I do anything um, mostly there, but I feel like another, like, couple days or or i might i don't know i mean like i'm just playing it when i wake up day by day so did anybody else get any pacific poison oak just a curiosity i got so much during training camp it was all over me okay all right i just wanted to make <laughs> but sure not during, not during the race though i must have rolled around more during the race <laughs> <laughs> okay. i didn't i where I come from, this part of Ohio is loaded with ivy and oak. And so, like, from a kid growing up, I probably ate it when I was in diapers. And that I just probably had this immunity from a child up. Um, right on. Well, I was just uh, maybe take us out with a vision of Arlen in diapers. Um, maybe just your... <laughs> Uh, your cute face right there with the, the, the blonde hair and the, the wonderful smile and then just you in diapers and then and just with a shirt that says the big ticket since that's the new nickname we're going to try to try to brand yeah that we're right going to have to get that printed on my shirt <laughs> do that yeah I want um, one that says Arlen's darling <laughs> <laughs> that goes all the you know, those would sell I need to I need to see if Arrow Viper can can uh, print some some of those and maybe like yeah, I should I should t give them permission to print that, and then like if I could collect royalties, maybe it would fund me if I wanted to go to UTMB next year or something. <laughs> well, fund you to go to UTMB. The uh, I guess that's a tricky piece for uh, all of you in being a bit in the spotlight, um, but I guess that's the reality of the. Uh, the beast of the world we live in, in terms of sponsorship dollars and where it's tricky for you, Arlen, being under the radar. I mean, if Ellie has a tough time hunting you down, um, you know, that it's, I was about to say the funding's definitely there for you to go to UTMB, but uh, I guess tricky if, if sponsors have to find you under a rock to, to get you to, uh, you know, get them exposed. But, but it would seem like it would be there for UTMB and it would be cool to see you, see what happens in the mix and just, see everybody else write you off because you're that kind of the unknown from Ohio, even if your nickname is the big ticket. Yeah. Well, I had a great time seeing you all uh, run uh, two weekends ago. I was stoked that you all had that experience and that adventure. Uh, most people will, will never have that opportunity. Uh, so you all earned it uh, well, uh, whether through ticket, uh, ticketing or Dobbin and just the work that you've been in over the years. It was awesome that you got it in before your uh, age 46. Um, so that's solid. Um, so any other parting things that would be fun to touch on or to put out there? Ellie, are you going to do another hundred mile? Uh, I haven't Definitely. decided on anything yet. So <laughs> I am, I'm attracted to the process of growth and getting better. So when I notice that there's things that I could definitely do better, I'd like to work on them, but, um, I, I don't know. I still haven't ran yet. So I think that's number one. <laughs> First step. Yeah. But the good luck to answer, you be, Marianne. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Who knows? Maybe you'll pull off the double. Not many people can do it well, but uh, 
on a, people that aren't American might be able to do it well. I have to work on my race day strategy. Yeah. <laughs> That's the, the summary of this podcast. <laughs> well, awesome. I'm stoked for all of you. And I'm really appreciative, or Ellie and I are both appreciative of uh, you just taking some time out of your, your evenings tonight. Uh, Davin, I hope you have a wonderful vacation uh, on deck uh, and quality uh, time with the family. Uh, Arlen, it was good to chat with you further and looking forward to uh, more opportunities in the future. And Marianne, yeah, I'm stoked also to see how the rest of the, uh, the season goes for you and to connect with you more as well. Uh, and then, uh, Ellie, I see you on a daily basis. So uh, I'm thankful for that as well. Uh, so uh, thank you for uh, spending time here tonight. Uh, thank you for all those who tuned in or uh, will tune in after the effect, after the fact, rather. Uh, thanks for all who support the Trails Collective and helping us to get all of these uh, amazing voices uh, out there. Uh, and uh, I'm grateful. Uh, so until the next round, um, well, actually, is, which is tomorrow night. Uh, so again, tune in tomorrow night. It'll be a round on mountains with uh, Whiteface and Mount Marathon and bring you some more voices. Uh, I will see you then. See you. See ya.